Thank you. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. This will be a contextualized reading for Beowulf. I already gave a kind of background history um, lecture, which is available for you. So we're going to dig uh, into the text. We'll probably do just about the first thousand lines or so in this uh, um, contextualized reading. Remember, this is to provide context, right? So hopefully you've already read the material, and this is just to solidify what has actually happened, give a little bit of context and help you along your way reading and in your scholarship. Um, there are definitely, like all scholars, I have particular uh, interests that I will hit of my own along the way, um, but this is not meant to be any kind of exhaustive or argumentative um, way of reading the piece. It's more about just kind of what happens. So uh, this is an Anglo-Saxon poem, as I covered earlier on, um, uh, when dealing with the Seamus Haney translation. Here I mentioned in the earlier uh, contextual, uh, contextual lecture that uh, we'd see that there is a Euro-Christian asymmetry. There is a hybridity to the way that the narrator um, who has written this down around the year 1000 has they're dealing with pagan contexts but they are inflecting it with a euro christian um uh uh framing and storytelling here being it being written down at a time where there's been great conflict between danish people or generally the vikings um and uh, England, especially um, up in Mercia, um, the middle portion of the island. Um, and so we see this poem being framed and directed and written down by Euro-Christians that are giving favorable accounts to um, uh, the people who live under Dane law in England at the time, right? So there's some interesting political context that we might want to be thinking about going on um, as this has happened. Remember, I mentioned some uh, a, an early genocide that had happened um, in uh, the year 1002. Uh, and so it's interesting with the enormity of the conflicts that arise that we see a text like this that seems to be trying to bring groups together. Uh, the narrator um, has alluded to a Euro-Christian type of God um, in the first 20 lines of the poem. Uh, let me get my notes uh, shared here again and get this out of the way so I can see my notes. Um, uh, we've begun with... Uh, the lineage of the Danes or the Shieldings, Shield Shafson, his son Baal, his son Halfdane, and then the son Hrothgar, who will be the king um, uh, who is presiding over the Herat or the Great Hall um, that has been under attack by Grendel, the evil one. Hrothgar is married to Weyalthio. Uh, um, the Christian god has been mentioned here remember jesus is not mentioned throughout the the poem um but there is a monotheistic reading going on and not a mention of any other pagan deities um so there seems to be a colliding or collapsing of odin or references to odin the norse god um with the um judeo-christian god we could call him yahweh if you want um for these contexts the wind uh storm god um from the desert. Uh, so we also get with the commentary um, these interjections of the Christian um, uh, narrator here. Um, a lot of commentary on morality or the right ways to behave. Um, and so uh, the poem tells us that a young prince must be prudent, 
giving freely while the father lives so that afterwards in age when fighting starts steadfast companions will stand by him and hold the line behavior that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere says the poet and so um we get a little bit of social context here that it seems to be the job of the prince or the young noble person to go out and make friends and to spread name uh, um, one's name throughout the world and to gather um, uh, um, uh, friends, alliances, who then might be able to help him when his father dies and there's some sort of contestation for power, right? So that seems to be part of the context. And that seems to be, once we do get to Beowulf, what he seems to be doing by making his journey over from Geatland, which is southern Sweden, to um, Denmark. Um, but we're back in the context of the shieldings here, um, uh, around line 30 of the poem, uh, um, shielding was th thriving when his time came and he crossed over into the Lord's keeping. His warrior band did what he bade them when he laid down the law among the Danes. They shouldered him out to the sea's flood. Uh, the chief they revered who had long ruled them. A ring world prow rode in the harbor, ice clad. And we get a description of this um, uh, the great ring giver. I'll say more about ring giving in just a second here. Um, but the way that this grand ship funeral um, is put out, we see that this um, this is an earlier time because we see a ship funeral being put out to sea. And with it, there's all sorts of treasures. So the poet says, no man can tell, no wise man in hall or, or weather veteran knows for certain who salvaged that load of treasure that's gone out. Later on, we do see ship build funerals or ship type of funerals that occur on the land. And when the settlements of, um, uh, in settlements of people who had um, come from Norse or Viking culture on the land of England. And so there are archaeological sites. So what, one of the things that we want to see in the shift from paganism to your, the Euro-Christian dominance is a shift from burning bodies, which is kind of pagan ritual, um, to the preserving and the containing of bodies within the earth or the burying of bodies, which is going to be a practice that shows the Christian influence because the idea is that the body is going to rise again from the earth with the second coming of Christ. Um, and so we see those early practices of burying and can really taking care of bodies, even showing up in like the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the sites at Qumran, um, which would be the earlier, some per perhaps at least the, there are various arguments, but um, the Essenes for example, being sects of people who started favoring the idea of burying a body intact um, with, um, and put with special care and almost in a fetal position facing the east on a north-south axis. So um, ancient burials show us a lot about, um, about different cultures. Um, I've written a little bit on um, uh, some earlier... Um, uh, Anglo-Saxon um, uh, recordings of, of funerals with the voyages of Wolfsant and, and Othera, which are um, record um, almost kind of like some anthropological or some some journeys over into the continent or up into Scandinavia um, among uh, that were then included in um, Alfred's um, compendious history of the the world. Um, so this is the late 800s as well. So it's interesting even there to look at what happens because um, there would be funeral games sometimes and there would be dividing up of a noble person's lot. But in this particular case, what's being recorded is a great um, noble person whose treasure goes with them out to sea. Um, so the noble people will be called a ring giver or a ring bearer and so we can you know hear the connotations in lord of the rings and stuff but the rings aren't just rings for your fingers the rings would be um the, uh kept around arm 
arm rings because this is a way that in the ancient world that you could keep your money with you right there aren't banks um there's no paper money there are coins but the coins could be melted down um or and then they wouldn't have to be held in a in a belt or something that you could lose easily if you could build an arm ring or multiple arm rings that kept your wealth on you um, and so you'll see that kind of thing in, in uh, even in mediatized uh, depictions of uh, people from the time period. That's a way that you could hold your wealth. So um, uh, a noble person would give treasure out to the people who supported them, and that would be in the form of various rings. Um, so after shielding, then Baal, his son, comes into power, and then we get a lineage down to Hrothgar, um, who then builds this hall after there's, he's had his exploits and made his mark on the world, and he builds the hall called the Herod. Um, And he was not stingy, right? He uh, doled out rings and torques at the table, Um uh, the Herod was the name he had settled on, whose utterance was the law. And so we're getting a little bit of references to Danish law in Denmark. But of course, we know that the Dane law is happening on, in England, too, and that this poem is being written down and performed and told to nobility um, in England. And that, that does seem to favor the Danish folks, but it is also told within a Euro-Christian lens or a Euro-Christian story framing. Um, the doom, this term doom, um, which is the Anglo-Saxon term for judgment, so doomsday comes from this. Um, the doom abided, but in time it would come, the killer instinct unleashed among in-laws, the blood lust rampant, then a powerful demon, a prowler through the dark, nursed a hard grievance. It harrowed him, him to hear the din of the loud banquet. Every day in the hall, the harp being struck, and the clear song of the skilled poet telling with mastery of man's beginnings how the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girdled with waters. In his splendor, he set the sun and the moon to be earth's lamplight, lanterns for men filled with broad lap of the world with benches and leaves and quickened life and every other thing that moved so what's being mentioned here and what i think is really interesting is that we see this introduction to grendel his name hasn't been mentioned yet in what i've read um but uh he's being associated with judgment or the decree dom or doom um, and he, he has a killer instinct unleashed among in-laws, the bloodlust rampant. The term here in the Anglo-Saxon, um, if you flip to the other side, is atham swearian. But um, uh, we don't have a good um, uh, glossary so much in the Seamus Haney version of the text, but in the Bruce Mitchell and Fred C. Robinson text, there's really the nice um, uh, uh, glossary in the back. And this is, of course, an Anglo-Saxon um, um, uh, version of the, of the poem itself that I used way back in graduate school when I was much more steeped in Anglo-Saxon studies. Um, I can't translate it sight anymore just because I'm not working um, uh, as frequently in, in the, the period. I mean, it would take some working up with the language again. Um, but in the Mitchell and Robinson version, we see that Atham Swearian notes a son-in-law or a father-in-law. So in some versions of Beowulf, you will see that there, there almost is a kind of familial resemblance or a family feud context that seems to be going on beneath Grendel. But he's also very much cast as the stranger, as an outlier, and of course depicted as um the clan of Cain, right? Cain and Abel being the brothers um, who um, are sons of Adam. Um, Cain slays Abel um, because uh, he's jealous that he has um, God's favor, right? In the Euro-Christian and, and Judaic and Islamic traditions, right? As well, the, the religions of the book or the Old Testament for the, um, at least for, uh, what the Christians call it, the Old Testament. 
So it's interesting because people have traditionally figured the monster Grendel as more fantastic in images. It's clear, though, that in the text itself, um, the sounds of the partying and the scop or the poet or the bard bothers Grendel. There's something about the what's going on in the Harris, what's going on in this this center of the partying that 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 really really unnerves Grendel. Um, the Old English word that's being used here is ghost. We get ghost from this, um, not demon. Although the if we look at the word daemon from the Greek and we trace it further back into earlier Proto-European lineages, we see similarities between the words. Um, uh, you think about ghost, like ghost doesn't necessarily have the connotation for us in English of necessarily always being evil or being, but a demon does. Um, so even though in Greek, the diamond doesn't necessarily have to be evil, right? So we want to think about the ways that Euro-Christian culture um, inflects um, the conditions of, of, of readerly reception here as well. So the nuances matter to me, especially in the translations, even if when we go back further in the etymology or the word histories, both daemon and geist could mean breath or wind or something like that. But we know that in Euro-Christian culture, these are going to, um, uh, there's going to be a harder division between the um, notions of good and evil, especially later once we get to the Protestant Reformation, but that's quite a bit later on, right? Um, so around line one, 106, we see that Grendel is depicted as Cain's clan. Um, uh, in um, an article by by Fletcher, or, or not an article, it's a book, sorry, called The Barbarian Conversion, um, uh, we uh, Fletcher notes that storytelling was indissolubly linked or connected with uh, Anglo-Saxons to the music of the harp. So what's interesting here is when we think about this story that's being told going back to the 500s or so, but then the poem being composed after that somewhere in the 600s or 700s, and then being written down closer to the year 1000, which is the version that we have of Beowulf, right? Um, uh, if we look back historically, the Venerable Bede, who's a Christian monk of a uh, very important um, historian, for us and, and gives us a lot of source work um, from the period. Um, 12 years after Bede's death, so Bede dies in 735, so at the year 747, monasteries in England officially prohibited poets, harpists, and musicians or jesters. We know that the practices didn't necessarily end um, there's archaeological evidence that shows that the practice continued, but officially speaking, Christian culture did not want to have these poets or these singers or shop, which is the old, Anglo, old English or Anglo-Saxon term. Fletcher, again in the Barbarian Conversion, says um, that the poem Beowulf was composed primarily for audiences of warrior aristocrats. Um, in line 12 of the poem, we get see them, uh, ogres, elves, and evil phantoms. So this is where the, fir the first mentions in the Anglo-Saxon or the English language come for elves and orcs. But we want to notice, as I mentioned in the earlier lecture, that we don't get physical descriptions of these entities, right? So our ideas of what orcs are that come from like watching Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings or... Uh, um, other sorts of uh, filmed versions um, come from the fantasy structures of 20th and early 21st century people looking back onto the medieval era, but we don't necessarily get those descriptions in the poems that first introduce those terms for those entities. So it's really hard for us to be able to get back into um, an, a, a medieval reading of this stuff, and we want to keep our own prejudices um, uh, from our own position in history in check as we try to read these old texts. Grendel also doesn't get a physical description. Uh, we know uh, uh, that Grendel appears to attack 
um, undefeated for 12 seasons. That number 12 is going to be super significant for Christians, um, especially being 12, the 12 apostles, and then the 13th would be Jesus himself. And so we see a lot of references to 12. We divide our calendars up in common use today, still from the Christian calendars, um, the Gregorian calendar, um, which comes later, of course, but um, 12 months of the year, right? 12 days of Christmas. Uh, and so 12 years, 12 seasons that Grendel attacks. Um, but we also are told by the poem that he cannot approach the throne. So because he is the Lord's outcast. So there's something that associates the throne and the leadership of the king with the sovereignty of a Euro-Christian king. Um, the word often used that there are no, numerous words in Old English that are used for ruler, and um, uh, this is important, um, especially because as Euro Christian culture comes in, we get translations of the Bible, and we want to see that term Lord that we get. Um, it's actually comes from Hlafford, which is a loaf guard, it's a word blend, it's two words loaf guard, Hlafford. And then it gets shortened to Lord. That's actually the word that um, <clears throat> when we get to English translations of the Bible, which weren't happening so much in the, the Anglo-Saxon period, but we see commentaries and homilies. So there's a lot of commentary from Christians, but it wasn't considered proper to translate the text. So that's why later on in English, we get a um, uh, um, the uh, translations of the Bible into the vulgar English, um, right? But that wasn't a custom that was that was always being um, uh, done. So there there are some early translations, and 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 it's an interesting point of study if you become a medievalist to think about um, translations of, of of at least aspects of the Bible. But when we see that Lord Lord showing up in like the Lord's Prayer, for example. Um, uh, um, uh, yeah, if you think about the English translations, like give us our day, the, our, our, our daily bread in the Lord's prayer, that word Hlafford or Hlaf Lord comes from loaf guard, the person who guarded loaves. And when it was translated through the Bible, whenever you, if you know anything about Bible translations in English, whenever, whenever you see the Lord L O R D being capitalized, that's the translation of the Hebrew tetragrammaton, um, which are is the YHWH is what it looks like to us, or Yahweh, right? Um, which is not the correct pronunciation. There is no pronunciation for it in Hebrew. Um, <clears throat> so the all of this comes down to um if if you're doing like a, a an Anglo-Saxon or if you're really paying attention to the text, I think it's important to look at the different words for lords because the one of the terms here that's used is metod or ruler, but it's also sometimes translated, comes, comes to have a connotation in Anglo-Saxon as weaver. And the term in Norse, there's a goddess called Uard or Erd, and the word gets translated into old Anglo-Saxon as weird, um, and that's the translation for fate. All the way into Macbeth, way later on with Shakespeare, we know that there are the weird sisters, which is Shakespeare combining traditions from Greek culture and classical culture of the three fates or the humanities um, with that Anglo-Saxon word weird. Um, which we still have today, but weird is associated with fates. In ancient cultures, sometimes you have an idea of fate, um, and that is separated sometimes from deities, even pagan deities. Sometimes it's they're combined together. But in classical Greek culture, even the gods like Zeus couldn't disrupt the fates that humanities had. So there's a separation in concepts. And so it allows us to parse out a little bit more of the ancient ways of thinking about the world. Um, other terms that show up for Lord or rulers in Anglo-Saxon in the text are Clafford, like I mentioned, Cleo, Aoral, or we get Earl from that, and then Dreton, 
show up as well. But metad or ruler also connotes the term weaver. Now we're going to come back to peace weaver and some gender stuff later on. So just hold on to that. Um, <clears throat> We go on and the narrator comments on paganism in the past tense around lines 175 to 188 in the text here. Um, <clears throat> so we've been told um, around 168 to 169 that Grendel can't approach the throne. There's something hallowed about the throne. It's associated with God. It's holy, right? And then uh, we're told, these were hard times, heartbreaking for the Prince of the Shieldings. Powerful counselors, the highest in the land, would lend advice, plotting how best to bold the bold defenders might resist and beat off sudden attacks. Sometimes at pagan shrines, they vowed offerings to idols, swore oaths that the killer of souls might come to their aid and save the people. That was their way their heathenish hope deep in this, their hearts, they remembered hell. The almighty judge of good deeds and bad, the Lord God, head of the heavens, and the ki high king of the world was unknown to them. Oh, cursed is he who in times of the time of trouble has to thrust his soul in the fire's embrace, forfeiting help. He has nowhere to turn. But the ble blessed is he who after death can approach the Lord and find friendship in the Father's embrace. So that's that kind of shifting language to the sermon. We see that paganism is being thought of as in the past tense, that they burned bodies, that they did sac burn sacrifices at times to their gods, but that didn't work. They did it at times of trial, um, and they didn't yet know the one true God who is able to give life after death. And so that is a, what, what I'm talking about, like the asymmetry of Euro-Christian influence when we look at this poem. Then we start getting the mentioning. We don't hear her mentioned by name, but we see Beowulf entering the text um, around line 195. When he heard about Grendel, Higlax Thane, was on home ground over in Geatland, that's southern Sweden, right? Um, uh, as we know it today, anyway. Uh, that Higlax Thane, that's Beowulf, right? We don't get him introducing his name till several lines later. There was no one else like him alive. In his day, he was the mightiest man on earth. Highborn and powerful, he ordered a boat that would ply the waves. He announced his plan to sail the Swan's Road and search out that king, the famous prince who needed defenders. That's Hrothgar, right? Um, nobody tried to keep him from going. No elder denied him, dear as he was to them. Instead, they inspected omens and spurned his ambition to go whilst he moved about like the leader he was, enlisting men the best he could find. So notice that there is still the practice, the pagan practice of looking for omens, looking for signs, some oftentimes bird signs showing up. Um, uh, um, uh, but he's spurred on. The, the elders are are are, are behind him, um, uh, uh, enlisting men the best he could find. With fourteen others, the warrior boarded the boat as captain, a canny pilot a ca along coast and currents. Um, and then I want you to notice the image language here. Again, I talked about how we see that break in between the lines. If you look at the Anglo-Saxon side of the poem, of the page here, um, and we see the kind of clauses, the, what we would call grammatically dependent clauses in English today. Um, but what we get with each one of those clauses is kind of like a little image. And that's, you know, of, co of course, this is being sung by the schkop, um or the, the bard um, uh, in Anglo-Saxon. But look at the language here as we see the ship going from Yeatland over to Denmark. Time went by, the boat was on water in the close, in close under the cliffs. Men climbed eagerly up the gangplank, sand churned in surf, warriors loaded cargo of weapons, shining war gear in the vessel's hold, then heaved out away with a will in their wood-wreathed ship. Over the waves, 
with the wind behind her, the foam at her neck. She flew like a bird until her curved prow had covered the distance. And on the following day at the dew hour, those seafarers sighted land, sunlit cliffs, sheer crags, and looming headlands the landfall they saw it was the end of their voyage and the geeds vaulted out over the side out onto the sand the moored and moored their ship there was a clash of mail and thresh of gear they thanked god for the easy crossing on the calm sea these are important parts in the epics if you go back and read the Odyssey, for example, notice those 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 moments, those those overnight magical moments where Odysseus's ship um, moves from the farthest reaches of the sea magically back with the Scythians, for example, um, uh, uh, back to his homeland of Ithaca. So almost this kind of like travel that gets where we get a mix of not like fish imagery but bird imagery where the ship is flowing over the waves um oftentimes almost like helped on with the wind and helped on with the gods um we see a watchman on the shore the shielding's watchman and notice the greeting the greeting comes with a kind of welcoming and with a kind of complimenting that we get from uh uh the coast guard here what kind of men are you arrived who arrive rigged out for combat in coats of mail, sailing here over the sea lanes in your steep hold boat. I've been stationed as a lookout on the coast for a long time. My job is to watch the waves for raiders, any danger to the Jan Danish shore. Never before has a force under arms disembarked so openly, not bothering to ask if the sentries allowed them safe passage or the clan had consented, nor have I seen a mightier man at arms on earth, the earth than the one standing here unless i'm mistaken he truly is noble so yes there's a bit of guardedness he's a coast guard but his his uh, uh demeanor is to compliment these strangers and welcome them then the leader of the troop of course this is beowulf but he hasn't named himself yet um, shows up the leader of the troop unlocked his word hoard distinguished the distinguished one delivered his answer we belong by birth to the geet people we and owe allegiance to lord higelac in his day my father was a famous man a noble warrior named ekthao so he introduces himself by the name of his father right um he outlasted many a long winter and went on his way all over the world men wise and counsel continue to remember him we come in good faith to find your lord and nation's shield the son half of half dane who's rothgar give us the night um the right advice on and direction we've arrived here on a great errand to the lord of the danes and i believe therefore there should be nothing hidden or withheld between us so tell us if what we have heard is true about this threat, whatever it is, the danger abroad and the dark nights, the corpse maker mongering death in the shielding's country, I come to proffer my wholehearted help and counsel. I can show the wise Hrothgar a way to defeat his enemy and find respite, if any respite is to reach him ever. I can calm the turmoil in the land." Um, uh, and so the Coast Guard greets them. Anyone with the gumption and the sharp mind will take the measure of two things, what's said and what's done. I believe you what you have told me. And so then he goes on to bear them up um, to the Herod um, to introduce them uh, um, to Hrothgar. Um, uh, but then he takes them up and then leaves them ago and he invokes God again. This is the poet, the Euro Christian poet. Um, uh, he's saying, describing the Herod here. He says, Majesty lodged there as light shone over many lands. So their gallant escort guided them to that dazzling stronghold and indicated the shortest way to it. Then the noble warrior wheeled on his horse and spoke these words. It's time for me to go. May the Almighty Father keep you and in 
keep you in and in his kindness watch over your exploits i'm away to the sea back to on alert against enemy raiders um and so then we get another image of beowulf's men coming up to the herit um it was a paved track a path that kept them march in marching order their mail shirts glinted hard and hand li linked the high gloss iron of their armor rang so we get this kind of um i think this is what tolkien means is that we could we get it's not just a sort of depiction of history there's definitely literary qualities to this we get dialogue we get description we get images um we get the sound being um uh, conveyed for us so duly arrived in the, the grim war grave at in gear at the hall and weary from the sea stacked wide shields of toughest hardwood against the wall then collapsed on the benches battle dress and weapons clashed they collected their spears in a seafarer's stook and stand of grayish tempering ash and the troops themselves were as good as their weapons then a proud warrior questioned them on their origins they tell them who um, again we see compliments showing up right um, I am Hrothgar's er herald and officer. I've never seen so impressive or large an assembly of strangers. Stoutness of heart, um, bravery and not banishment must have brought you to Hrothgar. Um, then they let them, uh, Beowulf then announces his name here around line 344. We are retainers from Higlax band. Beowulf is my name. If your lord and master, the most renowned son of Hafdan, will hear me out and graciously allow me to greet him in person, I'm ready and willing to report my errand. Then Wolfgar, or wolf spear, that gar is um, an early word for spear, wolf being wolf, right? Um, so Hrothgar is actually an earlier version of my name, like the current name Roger, is like derived from Hrothgar, right? Um, um, Wolfgar replies, a Wendell chief, um, renowned as a warrior, well known for his wisdom and temper of mind, says, I'll take this message in accordance with your wish to our noble, our noble king, king, our dear lord, friend of the Danes, giver of rings. Again, the different epithets, the different naming that accompanies that kind of lilting back and forth of the old English um, language. So we still can hear it a little bit, but we don't have the um, we're we're working with the later English, modern English, and the the patterns that come from um, uh, the French invasion and the shift towards a rigid syntax that gives us the rhythm that we have that da 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 da, -da um, uh, kind of language that we have today. Um, uh, again, we just want to keep noticing the Euro Christian presence of the narrator, um, Hrothgar. Um, greets them. Uh, he says that he knows of Beowulf's father. I used to know him when he was a young boy. His father before him was called Ecthao. Um, Hrethel the Geat gave Ecthao his daughter in marriage. So we see that there are these earlier alliances across the sea going on. Um, and he mentions providence, right? Now holy God has in his goodness guided him here to the West Danes to defend us from Grendel. This is my hope, and for his heroism, I will re recompense him with rich treasure. Go immediately, bid him in the Geats. Um, he has has an attendance to assemble and enter. Say, moreover, when you speak to them, they are welcome in Denmark. Um, uh, Um, they are told to leave their weapons and their shields outside. They leave a party to guard their shields. So that just tells us that even though they are welcome, that there's still stuff you got to watch out for and security in your forces. And then um, Beowulf comes in, and this is how he greets the assembly with a bit of boasting, I would say. <laughs> um Greetings to Hrothgar. I'm Higlax Kinsman, one of his hall troop. When I was younger, I had great triumphs. Uh, 
The news of Grendel hard to ignore reached me at home. Sailors brought stories of the plight you suffer in this legendary hall, how it lies deserted, empty and useless once the evening light hides under the heaven uh, under heaven's dome. So every elder and experienced councilman among my people supported my resolve to come here to you, King Hrothgar, because all knew of my awesome strength. They had seen me boltered in the blood of enemies when I battled and bound five beasts, raided a troll nest in the night sea, slaughtered sea brutes. I have suffered extremes and avenged the geats. Their enemies brought it upon themselves. I devastated them. Now I mean to be a match for Grendel, settle the outcome in singular combat. And notice that as he 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 seems to know some things um, about Grendel, and that Grendel doesn't have weapons. So he says, um, "I have heard, moreover, that the monster scorns in his reckless way to use weapons. Therefore, to heighten Higlax's fame and gladden his heart, I hereby renounce sword and shelter, and the shelter of the broad shield, uh, the heavy war board. Hand to hand is how it will be." a life and death fight with the fiend, which ever one death fells must deem it a just judgment by God. So again, the invocation of God, but also there's something about Grendel. Grendel doesn't either know, doesn't seem to know how to use weapons and doesn't use, use them. So uh, it's going to increase Beowulf's fame if he beats him hand to hand. Um, again, we see fate um, being mentioned um as well um at the end a fate goes as fate ever must um gath a weird swahio shell um uh so again the word weird and fate showing up there then hrothgar greets him um uh and we learn that beowulf's father sought refuge with hrothgar um who settled a debt um, to the wolfings. Um, and so we see this older intertextuality, we might call it, or at least family history, family lineages and treaties going across various groups. And we're going to see that through a lot throughout the text. And that's what kind of makes it hard for us to read because people are being referred to who we don't really have as modern readers any kind of access to. Um, uh, Rothgar says, I healed a feud by paying. I shipped a treasure trove to the Wolfings, and Ecthao acknowledged me with oaths of allegiance. So that's how debts are being settled from one person to another person is by making an allegiance or an alliance politically with another group. Um, uh, and so he says, it bothers me to have to burden anyone with all the grief Grendel has caused and the havoc he's wreaked upon us in Herat, our humiliations, my household guard are on the wane. Fate sweeps them away into Grendel's clutches, but God can easily halt these things, uh, these raids and harrowing attacks. Time and again, when the goblets passed and the seasoned fighters got flushed with beer, they would pledge themselves to protect the Herod and wait for Grendel with wetted swords. But when dawn broke and the day crept in, over each empty blood-spattered bench, the floor of the mead hall where they had feasted would be slick with slaughter. And so they died, faith retainers, and my following dwindled. Um, but then he welcomes them to take their place at the table, a banquet is introduced, the shkop or the bard starts to sing. And um, then after people have been feasting, um, we get this challenge from Unferth, a uh, son of Eklaf. And we'll hear a little bit more about there seems to be some feuding and family history going on with him as well, but we don't know that much. And it's very, again, one of those things that's hard for modern readers to deal with. So Unferth challenges Beowulf. Um, he says, it was sheer vanity. Your exploits were sheer vanity. You went um, uh, challenged 
um, Brecca to this swimming duel. It was like you put your kinsmen in danger. There, that seems to be a bit of the charge that's going on here. Um, uh, but you lost in this particular instance in the swimming contest to Brecca. Um, and then Beowulf um, counters the challenge. And so we see this kind of people have been partying and getting a bit drunk here. And Beowulf, Ecthéo's son, replies, well, friend Unferth, you have had your say about Brecca and me, but it was mostly beer that was doing the talking. The truth is this, and then he goes on to talk about sea monsters, how he had to fight for his own life, and this mightier exploit that happens that Unferth doesn't seem to know anything about. Uh, um, and he tells a great tale, right? He tells an adventure tale. Now, again, this is not a Greek text, but if you're reading ancient epics, you'll see that the warrior is not only just a great warrior, but even in the Odyssey, Odysseus is a great storyteller in his own right as well. And this pushes against that kind of like jock type version of Beowulf that we sometimes see in films that they're just like this big brute, bra 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 bra. But they're cunning and they're able to tell tales and their of their exploits. And yes, there's some bravado good that accompanies this, but he's able to entertain the guests as well in the Herod. And so there's that kind of that puts us into very much into the genre of epic here. Um, uh, um, so he tells of, of being able to uh, subdue the sea monster and then he comes back and he accuses Unferth here he says you killed your own kith and kin so for all your cleverness and quick tongue, you will suffer damnation in the depths of hell. The fact is, Unferth, you were truly as, if you were truly as keen or courageous as you claim to be, Grendel would have never got away with this such unchecked atrocity. Attacks on your king, havoc in the Herod, and warriors everywhere. So he comes back at Unferth at an even higher pitch and with a higher condemnation. You have killed your family members and that seems to be the the, the really the difficult charge um uh that's being made um uh and almost like the the two are going to come um into some sort of a fight um he who knows he need never be in dread of your bl blade making a mizzle with his blood or vengeance arriving ever from this quarter, from the victory shieldings, the shoulders of the spear. He knows that he can trample down you Danes to his heart's content, humiliate and murder without fear of repri reprisal, but he will find me different. I will show him how Geet's shape to kill in the heat of battle. Then whoever wants to may go bravely to mead when morning light scarfed in the sun dazzle shines forth from the south and brings another daybreak to the world and after this challenge to unfirth notice how wael theo hrothgar's wife the queen enters and she does this thing that my own professor alexandra olson would call her alki for short um uh was she was a, a great scholar of Anglo-Saxon and medieval texts in general. Um, and she mentions women and the roles of women in this time. And Wei Althea is doing the work of being the peace weaver. The work of the woman here is to kind of put at ease this drunken battling <laughs> that's going on between these warrior dudes who get their testosterone um, all riled up. So the gray-haired treasure giver was glad, far famed in battle. Um, the prince of bright Danes and keeper of his people counted on Beowulf, on the warrior's steadfastness and his word. So the laughter started, the din got louder, and the crowd was happy. Way out the out came in, Hrothgar's queen, observing the courtesies, adorned in her gold. She graciously saluted the men in the hall and handled 
than the cup. So this is more what Alki argues is that she's not just being a servant. She's a cup bearer, right? And she is bringing in the cup at the precisely the right time to put an end to this feud that's building up between Unferth and Beowulf. So the helming woman went on her rounds, queenly and dignified, decked out in rings, offering the goblets to all ranks, treating the household and the assembled troop until it was Beowulf's turn to take it from her hand. With measured words, she welcomed the geat and thanked God for granting her wish that a deliverer she, uh, she could believe in would arrive to ease the afflictions. He accepted the cup, a daunting man, dangerous in action, and eager for it always. He addressed wealth, wealthy owl. And he shows his ambition here. So ambition is an important trait for the warrior to have. There has to be a kind of balance to it um, uh, in the heroic code that's being presented here. So I haven't said a whole bunch about the heroic code, but we've seen that when the empty boasting um, uh, puts uh, family members or kin in danger, that's when it's gone too far. That's what Unferth is ch charging Beowulf with, and that Beowulf then comes back and says, you have actually killed your kin. Um, but uh, Beowulf has confidence and ambition. He's come out into the world to help Hrothgar, yes, because Hrothgar was an alliance of his father's, but also to gain fame for himself in the world, right? He says ambitiously in his formal boast, as, as they call it in the marginalia here, I had a fixed purpose when I put to sea, and as I sat in the boat with my band of men, I meant to perform to the utmost, uh, to the uttermost, sorry, what your people wanted to perish in, um, uh, wanted or perish in the attempt in the fiend's clutches. And I shall fulfill that purpose, prove myself with a proud deed or meet my death here in the mead hall. And the formal boast pleases Hrothgar and the lady as well. And then they party down um, for a while. Again, around line 680, um, we see that um, uh, Grendel doesn't have weapons. Uh, when it comes to fighting, I count myself as dangerous any day as Grendel, so it won't be a cutting edge I'll wield to mow him down easily as I might. He has no idea of the arts of war, of shield or sword play, although he does possess a wild strength. No weapons, therefore, for the, either this night unarmed he shall face me, if face me he dares, and may the divine Lord his wisdom grant, in his wisdom grant the glory and victory to whichever he sees fit. So there's ambition, then there's this balance off to, to um, the dome or the doom, right? The, the, the judgment of the Lord. Um, again, a little bit further down, um, down the brave man lay with his bolster under his head, and the whole company of sea rovers at rest beside him. None of them expected he could ever see his homeland again or get back to his native place and the people who um, reared him. They knew too well the way it was before, how often the Danes had fallen prey to death in the mead hall. But the Lord was weaving, again, that language of weaving, right? The, the, um, uh, weaving a victory on his war loom for the weather geats. Through the strength of one, they all prevailed. They would crush their enemy and come through in triumph and gladness. The truth is clear. Almighty God rules over mankind as he always has. So again, that shift to the Euro-Christian. Um, God is being one God in control of the fates of all men, even though we have that earlier imagery of the weaving of fates that goes back to weird, goes back to earth, that goes back to the Norse culture as well. Then there's a shift in scene, beautiful shift in scene that the poet gives us back over to Grendel, 
Off in the moors, down through the mist bands, God-cursed Grendel came greedily loping. The bane of the race of men roamed forth, hunting for prey in the high hall under the cloud murk. He moved towards it a uh, until it shone above him a sheer keep of fortified gold. Nor was that the first time he had scouted the grounds of Frothgar's dwelling, although never in his life before or since did he find harder fortune or hall defenders. Spurned and joyless, he journeyed on ahead and arrived at the bra um, the bon, the iron-braced door turned on its hinge when his hands touched it. Then his rage boiled over. He ripped open the mouth of the building, maddening for blood, pacing the length of the pattern floor with his loath loathsome threat tread, while a baleful light flame more than fl light flared from his eyes. He saw many men in the mansion sleeping, a ranked company of kinsmen and warriors quartered together, and his glee was demonic, picturing the mayhem before morning. He would rip life from limb and devour them, feed on their flesh by his, his fate, but his fate that night was due to change. His days of ravening um, come, had come to an end. But nevertheless, we get all sorts of creepy imagery around Grendel, but we don't ever get like a, a full on physical description of him. There's something psychological and macabre about this. Um, that is very like still present, I think, in, in, in Germanic cultures and uh, a, a kind of love for the darkness, um, even when I was in rock bands and touring in England or, or touring, touring in Europe. And uh, it seemed like whenever we were in, in Germany, there was a special love for the darker songs that we played. Um, uh, and then we get the famous battle between um, Beowulf and Grendel. Um, uh, as he comes in, uh, there's a wail that arises. Um, uh, then bewildering fear came over the Danes. Everyone felt it who had heard that cry as it echoed off the wall, a God-cursed scream and strain of a catastrophe, the howl of the loser, the lament of the hell surf keening his wound. He was overwhelmed, manacled tight by the man of all men. Uh, was foremost against the strongest of the um, strongest in the days of this life. So he come, Grendel comes in. He kills off immediately a few of the um, Geats and then walks into battle with uh, Beowulf. Um, again, it's mentioned that no blade on earth, no blacksmith art could ever damage the demon or opponent. So even if Beowulf had had a sword, it wouldn't have worked against Grendel, the poet tells us. And then we get the famous um, uh, um, uh, ripping off of Grendel's arm um, as well. Sometimes I've gone ahead of my notes here. Um, uh, um, around the line 814, the monster's whole body was in pain. A tremendous wound appeared on his shoulder. Sinews split and the bone lappings burst. Beowulf was granted under the Fenbex, fatally hurt to his desolate lair. Um, sinews split, right? And he lurks off away. Um, uh, and we get a little bit more of a picture. Um, his fatal departure was regretted by no one who witnessed his trail. This is that an instance of that understatement that appears throughout Anglo-Saxon poetry. <laughs> uh, the ignominious marks of his flight where he'd skulked away, exhausted in spirit and beaten in battle, bloodying the path, hauling his doom to the demon's mirror. The bloodshot water wallowed and surged. There were slothsome upthrows and overturnings of waves and gore, wound slur and wound slurry. What a great term, wind slurry. Um, uh, with his uh, death upon him, he had dived deep into his marsh den, drowned out his life, and his heathen soul, hell, claimed him there. 
and then we get a shift back to the to Beowulf. Beowulf has been, become the hero. The poet tells us that it was no blame of Hrothgar here. He was a good king, but sometimes in depictions, um, we see that some that that maybe there was something dark in Hrothgar's past. That somehow sometimes in films and stuff, how it's presented that Hrothgar had had these dealings with Grendel's mother, perhaps. So that kind of incestuousness, or that that there's like this distant family relation. Remember that there are the connotations to Grendel and a family feud that have gone on. But here, at least, the poet tells us that it wasn't Hrothgar's fault. Um, so I'm going to stop there. That's a little bit um, before line 1000, um, but I'll, I'll stop with Grendel's, uh, this lecture with th this being um, Grendel's defeat at the hand of Beowulf, and we'll pick up again in another lecture um, uh, with the uh, um, contextualized reading. Hope you're enjoying this, and um, so if you're not a student in my classes that you've already paid for, feel free to um, support us on uh, the Center for Critical Theory and Culture on um, uh, Patreon, if, if you like, if you're enjoying this, it helps us continue. Uh, have a great day or night or morning, wherever you are.